Putting up to it's important we look at the facts. Yeah. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal. <laughs> Hello there and welcome to another edition of Planet Hollywood. I'm Paul Hutchin, political editor of the Daily Record. Joining me this week are John Ferguson, political editor of the Sunday Mail, and Ben Borland, who is the editor of the Scottish Daily Express. So the last few months have been dominated by uh, events in the SNP. We had Nicola Sturgeon's resignation. We had a very protracted, divisive leadership contest and of course, the police investigation into SNP finances. This week has been comparatively quieter, uh, but of course that can change fast. So let's talk about some of the issues that have dominated over the last seven days or so. Um, ben, starting with you, there's been a, a long running row over the issue of Joanna Cherry, the SNP MP, and the Stand Comedy Club. Now, just to sort of condense the story, um, she was booked in to uh, do a sort of in conversation with Joanna Cherry event at the stand. And uh, basically they cancelled it over her views on trans rights. They said that staff didn't want to, uh, in effect, staff the event. And it's sort of grown arms and legs. Uh, you know, there might be legal action and whatnot. Um, what do you make of this controversy? And, and who has your sympathies in the row? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, Joanna Cherry clearly has has my sympathies. Um, I think it's a, a very dangerous road that we're going down with cancel culture, and um, this is you know just yet another example of uh, people um, being unwilling to 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 listen to uh, views that they don't agree with. You know, you don't have to agree with Joanna Cherry to work behind the bar in the Stand Comedy Club. You know, I, I, I've seen quite a few gigs at the Stand in both Edinburgh and Glasgow over the years, and I've heard some comedians say some fairly outrageous things. I'm sure the, the staff didn't agree with all of it. You know, it's it, it's it's extraordinary that you would that the staff there would say that that just listening to someone, an elected MP who represents thousands of people in their city um, would somehow be damaging to their, their their mental health. I think what's behind all of this, though, that, that really makes it interesting is the fact that the stand uh, was, was set up and is still owned by uh, Joanna Cherry's fellow SNP MP, Tommy Shepard. Mm. And what what kind of... You, you wonder what's gone on behind the scenes. Is there more to this? Could, could Tommy Shepard have done more to, to persuade the staff at the company he, he owns to, to, to be a bit more open-minded? Or ha has there been some sort of, um, you know, it, it, is this yet another um, kind of almost like a false flag operation in the, in the internal war within the SNP over the gender bill? I mean, I don't want to, say too much i don't know what's gone on behind the scenes it also looks as though it's heading for the courts um which would be you know yet another um extraordinary court case uh, for, for for us all to follow and who knows what would come out there but but certainly my sympathies are with joanna cherry and um you know anyone who's hit by cancel culture in this way it, it, it kind of started in the universities mm. It's, it's moved out now into the commercial sphere where, where people can say, I don't want to work in that environment. Uh, the, the one that springs to mind is Jerry Sadowitz at the mm. Fringe last year where his show was cancelled because uh, staff refused to, to do another shift if he, if he did his second night. I mean, I don't think uh, we'd ever thought we'd get to the point where Joanna Cherry and Jerry Sadowitz were, were on the same team. But then I, I doubt we ever thought we'd get to the point where Joanna Cherry and, and J.K. Rowling were on the same team. So, so, so yeah. pick you up, baby. Where, where do you draw the line then in terms of staff sensitivities? You know, at what point do they have a right to say, we don't want to staff this event because it's offensive content? 
Well, is there a I, I think the line is the, the legal line. If you are legally allowed to say something, then the, the, your workplace is legally allowed to, to stage that event. And, and, and really, it's a case of, you know, get on and do your shift. Um, How about you, John? What's your take on it? I, I think I think most people would agree that Joanna Cherry isn't expressing views that um, are illegitimate, and that she should be able to to do an event at the Stand Comedy Club. I'd be really interested to know was it the case that every member it would genuinely have been impossible for the sta the Stand to staff this event had she performed that, that would be quite extraordinary that does seem to be the argument that they're making um equally in the other in the other side of this the joanna cherry's kind of argument is that she's being silenced cancelled if you like um kez dugdale was argued quite eloquently in a column that um she's been anything but silenced she's um expressing her views and many different parts of the media at the moment and that if some of the staff at the stand don't want to to work at an event that she was due to attend then they should be free to do that and if it means the event needs to be cancelled then fine um but you know that that does seem like a, a great it, it seems like a shame that it's a, that it's a very eloquent woman who is um you know, expressing views that are perfectly legitimate should that you would have staff at a comedy club that's supposed to stand for open and free expression would, would take the view that they, they wanted to um they wanted to have that this event cancelled. Um that I, I think Ben's quite right that the really interesting thing here is whether this at the moment it's not really being um the, the narrative hasn't been that this is another yet another internal SMP battle, but as Ben said, the stand Tommy Sheridan founded the sorry Tom Tommy Shepherd founded the stand, and um, there's the SMP are currently going to court with the UK government over the GRR bill. That is one problem to contend with. It would be another huge problem if the SMP ends up going to court with the SMP over the GRR bill and that looks like what's going to happen here. So it's 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 a bit of a mess. Joanna Cherry surely should be free to to do her gig at the at this the stand. Um but equally you know it could be very damaging for everybody if this ends all, all ends up in court. Yeah it strikes me if you're watching something on the telly and you don't like it, just pick up the remote control and you know, change the channel if you know you don't like the the sound of a, a show that's coming up. Just don't buy a ticket. Um, but the idea of stopping it for everyone, effectively censoring someone, seems completely over the top. Um, John, I mean, how do you think it's going to be resolved? Do you think it will go to court, or do you think that maybe the stand will have a rethink and um, maybe find different staff to to um, put in charge of the event? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting whether someone's going, either someone's going to need to back down. I don't think that's going to be Joanna Cherry um, or else that's, you know, the, the court procedure is going to be settled in, in court. Um, Joanna Cherry seems to be very sure of our, our, the, that she's got a strong legal case here. I've not I've saw that defended by various lawyers um so it would be it would be really interesting to see how it's how it's re resolved I, if i was uh tommy shepherd i think i would be keen to find some staff that could come in and do a shift and just let this event go ahead i think that would probably yeah. save them a lot of money if nothing else yeah indeed um otherwise it's going to be a pretty decent payday for the lawyers um let's just move on to first minister hamza yusuf Obviously, his first few weeks in office were um, very difficult for him, mostly brought on by external events, such as the, the police investigation into the SNP, which focused on issues relating to uh, his predecessor, 
or rather uh, people who were in charge when Nicola Sturgeon was, was leading the party. Do you sense, John, that Hamza might be turning the corner a little bit? You know, he said his anti-poverty summit, there's been a big debate on uh, how he wants to reduce poverty. Uh, there's been more policy discussion, uh, more bits of his agenda have come out. Is he finally sort of, sort of breaking free from the shackles of the past and been able to advance his own agenda, do you think? Yeah, I think that's that's really that's that's true. I think people have underestimated him. In some ways, he's a very experienced minister. Um, he's come in under very difficult circumstances. What he said, he wants to put fighting poverty right at the centre of his agenda, and you know he seems to really believe in that. And I, I think over the last week or so, he does seem to have turned a bit of a corner. He's got he's managed to get people talking about the things he wants to get them talking about rather than rather than um, other external things. I think the problem we've got is that um, these other things that are completely out with his control, like the um, police investigation into the SNP's finances can come back at any point. And when they do, they will inevitably completely dominate the agenda and everything that he's saying is going to be placed to one side. So he, that that's something that really he's he can do very little about. I think the thing that he can do something about are some of the other things that are going to inevitably come back to bite him. Things around GRR and his legal challenge there, uh, the fishing ban, the deposit return scheme. These are all. We've also got the you know, the the huge unrest in the legal profession that the, is the moves to pilot uh, jury free rape trials. So all of these things are the things that he can control, and he, you know he needs to I think sit down with his ministers and his special advisors and have a really good think about which ones of which of these battles he he wants to fight because he probably can't do them all. Um, ben, do you agree with John if people underestimated the new First Minister? Um, I agree with John in that he's, he, he, he does seem to have slightly turned a corner in this past week. Um, I think it's too early to say we've underestimated him. I mean, the estimations, the, the estimations couldn't have been lower. I mean, he, he was tipped as a, a complete disaster. So... The last week or so, yeah, I think there's the there's signs. I mean, I nearly fell off my chair last week when he said something I agreed with. Um, and what and, was that? And he, <laughs> well, when he said that, uh, why should his daughter get free school meals? Uh, and, it, and, it, and it was almost like it was a, a Paul on the road to Damascus moment. He, he, suddenly, in a blinding flash of light, he said, hang on. I earned £140,000 a year. Why should taxpayers pay for my daughter's sandwiches? And it was like, yeah, exactly. All, all this stuff isn't free. It's all paid for by the taxpayers. And, and I thought, gosh, there's, there's some the use of actually having some original thoughts. But obviously, it was slapped down within hours by Shona Robeson, which raises another interesting question of, if the deputy first minister can correct the first minister, who, who's in charge? Is it Shona with, uh, you know, Nicola Sturgeon on speed dial over in Uddingston? Or, or, or is Humza Yusuf running the, the government? If you just come in there, Ben, John, um, you've got a, something that's got a campaign on free school meals. Do you agree with what Ben said about uh, no. the free school no, meals? No, I think there's... there's uh, huge amount of evidence that school meals are a very good thing to have a universal approach on. Um, there's loads of evidence that there's um, the, the stigma of being the child in the class with a dinner ticket means that there's not a great uptake of school meals for the kids that need them and that there's lots of money that could be saved just by doing away with all the administration costs of charging some kids, not charging others, means testing, if you if you're just to make school a place that you get a healthy, nutritious lunch, then that could be a huge benefit and done at a reasonably low cost. So I, I don't think that's a, I think I think this is a great example of a 
policy where universality is the correct approach, as Hamza said today, the SNP are the party of universality, and what, I think he's totally right to say that. Um, I think it was a silly thing for Hamza to say, to, to, to question universality in this context, because he, clearly he's, he's already delivering free school meals to primary one to fives, and has confirmed that he is going to extend that to primary six and seven and run a pilot scheme in secondary schools. So I think he's, you know, he's, he's already committed to the general principle of free school meals and I would very much hope that he's going to extend it. Ben, um, John thinks that universal free school meals is the best approach. I must admit, I hadn't realised uh, there was a Sunday Mail campaign. I do, I have been following it, John, but I, <laughs> it, it just slipped my mind. It wasn't just a sort of tee up. Uh, Speak you your mind. Speak your mind. mind. Um, but, but, but no, I mean, I, I stand by. I, I don't think universal free school meals. I don't think universal free prescriptions. I, I, I'm not convinced by the arguments for for universality, and it's mainly because. As I said before, they're not free; they're paid for by by, by taxes, and and that's where the Scottish government needs to get its its priorities. Well, even a universal health service. Well, and I mean, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Express here, but but I, I think there's questions around a universal health service, personally. But you know, I, on, Ben, bloody I, hell. Well, I'm only agreeing with I'm only I'm only agreeing with the Scottish Government working group that was set up last year. Um I mean certainly free prescriptions. Again, you know, what why should Humza well, use well, the alternative be yeah. a sort of US get style free, free paracetamol? Sorry, Paul. What, what so what you're suggesting is an alternative, like a US based private No, insurance? well see this is it. It's always it's either US or free. The, every other Western democracy manages to have something in the middle and they all have better health services than we do. I lived in Australia for a while. You pay uh, a, a insurance, you pay at the point and, and, and it's a better healthcare system. Germany, yeah, France. They, they, you know, the insurance companies de determine what you get. You know, you need well, the small well, print. Well, we do. I bet, put, put, put the USA to one side, I bet there's not another country in, uh, in Western Europe that, that has a health service with as many problems as we do because we're so wedded to the idea that it must be free. Um, anyway, that, that as I say, that is not the expressive view. That's, that's my <laughs> personal view. Um, and, uh, uh, and I'm sure Humza Yusuf won't buy that. I mean, if you want, you know, if he, I, I just thought it seemed like he was having an original idea and, and, and and if he wasn't having an original idea, it was a mistake. So there you go. That that, that there's another blunder. All right, let's move on. Um, I, I guess anything that the Express editor agrees with is a blunder. If Hamza Yusuf <laughs> says it, that great alliance, Hamza Yusuf and the Daily Express, who'd have thought it? Um, so let's turn to Rutherglen and Hamilton West. This is the Margaret Ferrier seat. We're expecting a by-election later this year. Now, Labour have got their act together. They've selected a candidate, Michael Shanks, um, although some local activists think that it was a complete stitch-up over the exclusion of a couple of local candidates. Um, Labour have had some negative headlines about this, but John Jenkins, they're in a pretty good place now. They've got their candidate, and that candidate will be out and about, knocking doors, putting himself about. Um, are they well-placed to take this seat, do you think? Yeah, I think they've got a really good chance of of winning, and it would be a massive psychological boost for Labour if they did. Equally, if the SNP could retain that seat, it would be a, an enormous um, boost for them. Um, so there's obviously a wealth of attack lines for the uh, for the Labour Party to go on here. You're talking about a, a SNP have been in government for well over a decade um there's failings in pretty much every department that can be pointed to there's also the allegations of corruption and sleaze um so labor have got everything to play for and could 
certainly win this. I guess the one thing that they need to avoid is ending up having some kind of internal dispute um, that's already happened in, in the, the, the relation to the selection procedure. And the, the, you know, they, I think if the party wants to win this seat, they've got to just accept that that is the candidate now and they all need to get behind them. Yeah, it does feel like this by-election could be a, a watershed moment in Scottish politics. I mean, Labour have been in the doldrums for so long. I can't remember the last time they won a by-election against the SNP, but I think that their odds on to win it. Uh, ben, there was that story um, a few weeks ago about um, the Scottish Tories maybe urging folk to vote Labour in certain constituencies at the general election. Now, I would imagine they will field a, a candidate in the by-election, but would you imagine that they won't be trying too hard in the hope that Labour defeats the SNP? Um, I think, I mean, that's kind of traditional in by-elections where you, you don't stand too much of a chance of winning. I mean, the, the pressure's really on Labour. Let, let Labour have to win this by-election. Mm. I think if they don't, then the general election... It, 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 it's not just a watershed in Scottish politics. It's it's a big moment in British politics. If they don't win this by election, I can't see Keir Starmer winning a general election. It's as simple as that. I mean, they held the seat in 2017 to 2019. It, it's a very very winnable Labour seat under normal circumstances. Never mind with the current. Um, turmoil in the SNP and the fact that Margaret Ferrier, despite the fact she's an independent, I think still, you know, she's, she, she will still damage the SNP campaign. I, I mean, Labour have to win it. It's a must win. They, they'll be wishing the by-election was was being held sooner because, I mean, I, I don't know what the timing's going to be, but it, it could be quite a while before it actually takes place, I think. Um, John, is Ben right? Do you think the pressure is actually on Labour to deliver on this? The expectations with SAP are so low, given the circumstances of a potential by-election, the police investigation, uh, the leadership contest, all the divisions, that the heat is very much on Labour to, to, to take the, the SNP scalp here? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, the, the, it's, Labour are in a funny position at the moment in that they are ahead in the polls, um, generally, but there's a feeling that they're not ahead enough, that they're, the Conservative Party are mired in all kinds of controversies, and yet Labour are failing to really sort of make hay from that. So I, I think the pressure is on on them. They, they will desperately want to win it, and it's, you know, it's the difference between a huge positive story and a, a really negative one for them and equally it's the difference between a hugely negative story for the SNP or a massively positive one if they were to win that seat then that would be viewed as a vindication that the you know all of these other things aren't really coming through with voters and that the party's still delivering so yes yeah, it really is a it's a as crunch a by-election as you could get I think the, I mean, yeah. the comparison that I'm sure the, um, the Labour will be thinking of is the Govan by election mm. in 1988 when they, it was seen as the real turning of the tide towards the SNP at that point. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's going to be fascinating to watch. Now, I think we're about over 18 months away from the general election, but it does seem to be inching closer. Uh, people are talking about it more. And, you know, Ben, see from a you know, a conservative perspective. What do you think Sunak will want the dividing line to be between the Tories and Labour at this general election? Um, I mean, clearly, it doesn't really play out up here, but the small boats bill mm. um, is, is is his big policy, um, his big domestic appeal uh, to English voters. Um, sounds crazy given that his predecessor and her chancellor basically crashed the economy. But I, I still think that the 
the, the economy is going to be his um, his pitch, which is yeah. I mean, you see on that, what 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 strikes me as being a bit weird is that the small boats stuff has happened on the watch of the Tory government. The economic crash happened on the watch of the Tory government, and yet they're kind of saying we're best placed to clean up our own mess. I mean, it's is it not a bit cheeky? It, it's very cheeky, but. You know, the, 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 that's the the same problem all incumbent parties have when they've been in government for, for a long time. It's the same problem the SNP have, um, where, where you have to at the at one, you almost have to remove yourself from the problem you helped create and put forward a solution to fix it. Mm. It's you know, it's it's not a new. Uh, problem that, that, that parties have had. I think the very nature that, that the Tories have been in a long time, coming up to the end of that kind of 15-year cycle that we've we've seen in British politics before, it, it's going to be a hard one to, to win. Um, I mean, that there are... It, the polls look like we're heading for a hung parliament. I, I guess the interesting question mm. is, what deals are there to be done? Yeah, and John, I mean, clearly Labour don't want uh, the election to be fought on the small boats issue. Um, yeah, How do you think they're going to try and frame it? What do you think the main dividing line will be uh, from a, a Labour strategist perspective? I think that this is, this is the question that everybody wants answers. I mean, the reason the Conservatives are, are concentrating in small boats is because it's all they've got to concentrate on. They don't want people to think too much about the economy and the utter disaster that they, we've got there on their watch. Everybody's getting poorer. Inflation's been running haywire. There's, you know, people are could notably see their living standards falling at the moment. Um, some of that can be put down to the pandemic, but obviously, even when it comes to pandemic policy, there's, you know, the huge questions to answer over. Um, some of the people who were making money from that and everybody else who's getting poorer and the huge elephant in the room is Brexit and just how big an impact that is having on people's living standards. I think any mm. sensible observer can see that it's having a huge impact that Britain is doing way worse than other similar European countries and that's because we've got all these new trade barriers and place, it's pushing prices up in supermarkets, it's damaging jobs, it can't be, there's nobody to work in many industries in the UK. So it breaks, it's an utter disaster. And the interesting thing, I think, is what are Labour going to come up with to show that they realise that and that they've got something new to offer? Um, and I think that is, this is the problem for Labour. That, um, you know, everybody knows what they're against. Keir Starmer's getting quite good at slagging off the Conservatives. So it's got for the various, uh, you know, scandals that they find themselves in. People, what you want to know is what does he stand for? And I think there's a real danger that um, he's. He thinks that just by keeping his head down, by saying that not too much would change, that Brexit's all done and dusted, nothing's going to change there, that there's still going to need to be a certain amount of austerity, that he's, you know, he's he's, he's talking to Middle England, isn't he? he, to, he he's mm. desperately trying to win back the, these sort of middle class voters that he thinks so could go either way and he, he just wants them to, to feel secure that Labour aren't going to take their money off them in tax or and he's also trying to appeal to those red wall seats but I think by doing that and failing to really come up with anything to excite people anything that seems a bit inspirational and visionary is the danger is that Conservatives keep on closing the gap and mm. then as we've seen so many previous general elections the Conservatives just end up pipping them to the post. I think it's odd that Keir Starmer's not, I mean he seems to like to just lay down the law in these things, he says there's not going to be any kind of deal with the SNP, it's not going to be any kind of 
to like give on a second referendum. It's just utterly off the table, despite the fact he clearly wants to be in government in 10 years time. Um, and I think equally it's odd that he doesn't see that we're going to need to at least move into a soft Brexit position at some point over the next 10 years and that with a bit of leadership there's a story that he can tell in that that voters would like to to hear you know I think people yeah. in large understand that there's huge advantages to having a relationship with Europe and that this idea that you can completely sever that has been disastrous for all of us. I think that if this general election is about who do you want in Downing Street, Sunak or Starmer, it's going to be very difficult for the SNP to get into that conversation. I think that uh, independence is going to be much less of an issue in the general this time around than it has been last time. So maybe watch for that as well. Um, just summing up, good week, bad week. Let's start with you. Ben, who have you got for us? Uh, <clears throat> good week, Penny Mordaunt. Um, uh, the, the leader of the house who we're big fans of on the Scottish Daily Express uh, <laughs> business, business questions uh, against the SNP are always always a highlight of the week at Westminster but but clearly and we've not got the photo here but clearly she was a, a sensation at the coronation um, carrying uh, the, the, the the sword I think she was on her feet holding these heavy historic, bejeweled swords for 51 minutes and um, people around the world seem to be more interested in who she was than who King Charles, you know, th th than King Charles. Um, so Penny Mordaunt's had a good week and on the back of becoming a, a, a meme, she's now uh, back in the running to be the next Tory leader. So, so that's uh, it's good for her. Uh, bad week, Karen Adam. Um, who was one of, I think she's the Banff and Buchan MSP. She spoke out against the marine, uh, the, basically the fishing bans that, that are being proposed uh, because obviously she's got both Fraserburgh and Peterhead in her constituency, uh, spoke out very strongly, but then um, failed to, to, to put that to the test when it came to a vote and then after not uh, after not voting against it, she then wrote an opinion piece saying how Holyrood was letting down our fishing communities, which I mean just astonishing. How people don't see through some of these MSPs and the. And the so Karen Adam, if you're watching, you're not going to get a call with the Daily Express, just in case you were wondering. No, no, you're not. No. Um, John, how about you? Who's getting a positive? Who's getting a minus? So I'm going to say it's been a good week for Fergus Ewing. Um, Fergus is, you know, is as close to SNP royalty I think as you could get. His mother was a famous nationalist. He's been a lifelong party member. He's been a minister for over a decade, I think. Um, and you know, so there's been no uh, more diligent servant of the SNP than. Fergus, um, but, but he's just uh, over the last month or so, he's started to speak out on things that he clearly just feels aren't right within the party. He's been talking about the fishing ban. He's been talking about um, just th th he's been talking about the, the the coalition with the Greens, and he's in you know in very simple terms just saying that he thinks these things are wrong that the party is making big mistakes and I think he's, got, he's clearly got quite a bit of sympathy among his own colleagues and some of the points that he's he's making um I, I, he's clearly he's not he's isn't someone who's going to be cowed by the whips or anything like that and he, he seems to be enjoying himself um in terms of who's a bad week I'll say Joanna Cherry um, she's been banned from a comedy club that's had some of the most controversial acts in the world on their stage. Um, but I think we should probably all watch this space. She's a savvy operator. She's got a legal challenge in motion, and I wouldn't be surprised if she's going to end up turning this one 
around in our favour. Great. That's excellent. Thank you for that. Um, that's it for another week. I hope you enjoyed the latest Planet Hollywood. Thanks to John and to Ben for their expert analysis and commentary. Please join us again next week. It's important we look at the facts. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal.